Joe Andrewing, as a famous uh, computer science professor at Stanford, was really early on in the development of neural networks with GPUs. Of course, a creator of Coursera and popular courses like Deep Learning.ai, also the founder and creator uh, and early lead of Google Brain. Uh, but one thing I've always wanted to ask you before I hand it over, Andrew, while you're on stage, uh, is a question I think would be relevant to the whole audience. Uh, 10 years ago, uh, on problem set number two of CS229, you gave me a B. <laughs> and I was wondering, I looked it over, I was wondering what you saw that I did incorrectly. <laughs> so anyway, Andrew. Thank you, Hansin. I'm um, looking forward to sharing with all of you what I'm seeing with AI agents, which I think is an exciting trend that I think everyone building in AI should pay attention to. And then also excited about all, all the other uh, What's Next presentations. So AI agents, you know, today the way most of us use large language models is like this, uh, with a non-agentic workflow where you type a prompt and generate an answer. And that's a bit like if you ask a person to write an essay on a topic, and I say, please sit down at the keyboard and just type the essay from start to finish without ever using backspace. Um, and despite how hard this is, LMs do it remarkably well. In contrast, with an agentic workflow, this is what it may look like. Have an AI, have an LLM, say, write an essay outline. Do you need to do any web research? If so, let's do that. Then write the first draft, and then read your own first draft, and think about what parts need revision. And then revise your draft, and you go on and on. And so this workflow is much more iterative, where you may have the LLM do some thinking, um, and then revise this article, and then do some more thinking and iterate this through a number of times. And what not many people appreciate is this delivers remarkably better results. Um, I've actually been really surprised myself working on these agent workflows, how well, how well they work. I want to do one case study. My team analyzed some data uh, using a coding benchmark called the Human Eval Benchmark, released by OpenAI a few years ago. Um, but this has coding problems like, Given the non empty list of integers, return the sum of all the odd elements around even positions. And it turns out the answer is you know, a code snippet like that. So today, a lot of us will use zero shot prompting, meaning we tell the AI, write the code and have it run on the first pass. Like, who codes like that? No human codes like that. We just type out the code and run it. Maybe you do. I can't do that. Um, so it turns out that if you use GPT 3.5, uh, zero shot prompting, it gets it 48% right. Uh, GPT-4, way better, 67% right. But if you take an agentic workflow and wrap it around GPT-3.5, say, it actually does better than even GPT-4. Um, and if you were to wrap this type of workflow around GPT-4, you know, it, it, it also um, does very well. And you notice that GPT-3.5 with an agentic workflow actually outperforms GPT-4. Um, and I think this has, and, and this means that th this has significant consequences fighting how we all approach building applications. So agents is a term that's been tossed around a lot. There's a lot of consultant reports talk about agents, the future of AI, blah, blah, blah. I want to be a bit concrete and share with you um, the broad design patterns I'm seeing in agents. It's a very messy, chaotic space. Tons of research, tons of open source. There's a lot going on, but I try to categorize a um, bit more concretely what's going on in agents. Reflection is a tool that I think many of us should just use. It just works. Uh, to use, I think it's more widely appreciated, but it actually works pretty well. I think of these as pretty robust technologies. When I use them, I can you know, almost always get them to work well. Um, planning and multi-agent collaboration, I think of it as more emerging. When I use them, sometimes my mind is blown for how well they work. But at least at this moment in time, I don't feel like I can always get them to work reliably. So let me walk, walk through these four design patterns in a few slides. And if some of you go back and yourself or ask your engineers to use these, I think you'll get a productivity boost quite quickly. So reflection, here's an example. Let's say I ask a system, please write code for me for a given task. Then we have a coder agent, just an LLM that you prompt to write code, to say, you know, def do task, write a function like that. Um, an example of self-reflection would be if you then prompt the LM with something like this. Here's code intended for a task, and just give it back the exact same code that we just generated. 
and then say check the code carefully for correctness, sound efficiency, good construction for just write a prompt like that. It turns out the same LLM that you prompted to write the code may be able to spot problems like this bug in line five, but you fix it by blah, blah, blah. And if you now take his own feedback and give it to it and reprompt it, it may come up with a version two of the code that could well work better than the first version. Not guaranteed, but it works, you know, often enough for this to be worth trying for a lot of applications. Um, to foreshadow two use, if you let it run unit tests, if it fails a unit test, then goes, why do you fail the unit test? Have that conversation and be able to figure out, fail the unit test, so you should try changing something and come up with V3. By the way, for those of you that want to learn more about these technologies, I'm very excited about them. For each of the four sections, I have a little recommended reading section at the bottom that you know, hopefully gives more references. And again, just to foreshadow multi-agent systems, I've described as a single coder agent that you prompt to have it, you know, have this conversation with itself. Um, one natural evolution of this idea is instead of a single coder agent, you can have two agents where one is a coder agent and the second is a critic agent. And these could be the same base LM model, but that you prompt in different ways. We say one, your expert coder, right, code. The other one say your expert code reviewer has to review this code. And this type of workflow is actually pretty easy to implement. I think it's such a very general purpose technology for a lot of workflows. This would give you a significant boost in, in the performance of LMs. Um, the second design pattern is to use. Many of you will already have seen you know, LM-based systems uh, uh, using tools. On the left is a screenshot from um, uh, Copilot. Uh, on the right is something that I kind of extracted from uh, GPT-4. But, you know, LMs today, uh, if you ask it, what's the best coffee maker in your web search for some problems, LMs will generate code and run code. Um, and it turns out that there are a lot of different tools that many different people are using for analysis, for gathering information, for taking action, for personal productivity. Um, it turns out a lot of the early work in tool use turned out to be in the computer vision community. Because before large language models, LMs, you know, they couldn't do anything with images. So the only option was that the LM generate a function call that could manipulate an image, like generate an image or do object detection or whatever. So if you actually look at literature, it's been interesting how much of the work um, in two years, seems like it originated from vision because LMs were blind to images before, you know, GPT 4V and, and, and Lava and so on. Um, so that's two years and it expands what an LM can do. Um, and then planning, you know, for those of you that have not yet played a lot with planning algorithms, I, I feel like a lot of people talk about the chat GPT moment where you're, wow, never seen anything like this. I think if you've not used planning algorithms, many people will have a kind of a AI agent, wow, I couldn't imagine an AI agent doing this. So I've run live demos where something failed and the AI agent rerouted around the failures. So I've actually had quite a few of those moments where, wow, you know, can't believe my AI system just did that autonomously. But um, one example that I adapted from a Hugging GPT paper, you know, you say, please generate an image where, the girl's read where a girl is reading a book and it poses the same as a boy in the image, example.jpg, and please describe the new image with your voice. So give an example like this. Um, today, with AI agents, it can kind of decide, first thing I need to do is determine the pose of the boy, um, then, you know, find the right model, maybe on Hugging Face, to extract the pose, then next, you need to find a post-image model to synthesize a picture of a, of a girl of, as following the instructions, then use uh, image to text, to, and then finally use text-to-speech. And today, we actually have agents that, I don't want to say they work reliably, you know, they're kind of finicky, they don't always work, but when it works, it's actually pretty amazing. But with agentic loops, sometimes you can recover from earlier failures as well. So I find myself already using research agents for some of my work where I'll want a piece of research, but I don't feel like you know Googling myself and spend a long time. I should send to the research agent, come back in a few minutes and see what it's come up with. And, and it, it sometimes works, sometimes doesn't, right? But that's already a part of my personal workflow. The final design pattern, multi-agent collaboration. This is one of those funny things, but uh, um, it works much better than you might think. Uh, uh, but on the left is a screenshot from a paper called um, Chat Dev, uh, which is completely open, which is actually open source. Many of you saw the you know flashy social media announcement of demo of a Devin. Uh, 
uh, chat dev is actually open source. It runs on my laptop. And what chat dev does is an example of a multi-agent system where you prompt one LLM to sometimes act like the CEO of a software engine company, sometimes act like a designer, sometimes act like a product manager, sometimes act like a tester. And this flock of agents that you build by prompting an LLM to tell them, you are now a CEO, you are now a software engineer. They collaborate, have an extended conversation, so that if you tell it, please develop a game, develop a GoMoki game, they'll actually spend you know, a few minutes writing code, testing it, uh, iterating, and then generate a like surprisingly complex programs. It doesn't always work. You know, I've used it, sometimes it doesn't work, sometimes it's amazing, but this technology is really um, getting better. And, and just one of the design pattern, it turns out that multi-agent debate, where you have different agents, you know, for example, it could be have ChatGPT and Gemini debate each other. That actually results in a, a better performance as well. So having multiple simulated AI agents work together has a more powerful design pattern as well. Um, so just to summarize, I think these are the these are the the, the uh, patterns I've seen, and I think that if we were to um, use these uh, uh, patterns, you know, in our work, a lot of us can get a productivity boost quite quickly. And I think that um, agentic reasoning design patterns are going to be important. Uh, this is my small slide. I expect that the set of tasks AI could do will expand dramatically this year. Uh, because of agentic workflows. And one thing that is actually difficult for people to get used to is when we prompt an LM, we want to respond right away. Um, in fact, a decade ago, when I was you know, having discussions around at, at, at Google on um, we called a big box uh, search, we type in long prompt. One of the reasons you know, I failed to push successfully for that was because when you do a web search, you want to respond back in half a second, right? That's just human nature. We like that instant grab, instant feedback. But for a lot of the agent workflows, um, I think we'll need to learn to dedicate a task in AI agent and patiently wait minutes, maybe even hours uh, to, for a response. But just like, I've seen a lot of novice managers delegate something to someone and then check in five minutes later, right? And that's not productive. Um, I think we need to, it's, it's really difficult. We need to do that with some of our AI agents as well. I saw, I saw some laughs. Um, and then one other important trend, fast token generation is important because with these agentic workflows, we're iterating over and over. So the LM is generating tokens for the LM to read. So being able to generate tokens way faster than any human to read is fantastic. And I think that um, generating more tokens really quickly from even a slightly lower quality LM might give good results compared to slower tokens from a better LM, maybe, it's a little bit controversial, because it may let you go around this loop a lot more times, kind of like the results I showed with GPT-3 and an agent architecture on the first slide. Um, and candidly, I'm really looking forward to Cloud5 and uh, Cloud4 and GPT-5 and Gemini 2.0 and all these other wonderful models that many people are building. And part of me feels like if you're looking forward to running your thing on GPT-5 zero shot, you know, you may really get closer to that level of performance on some applications than you might think with agenting reasoning, um, but on an early model. I think I, I, I think this is an important trend. Uh, uh, and honestly, the path to AGI feels like a journey rather than a destination, but I think this type of agent workflows could help us take a small step forward on this very long journey.